I want to just take a few minutes here, uh, even though it's just a bit unconventional, if you don't mind. I want for us to pray together as a, as a church family about a couple of things. First of all, it's a strange time that we're living in, wouldn't you agree? I think, you know, after 2020 and the whole COVID thing, it feels like, you know, we, it feels like the human experience, the universe, the record skipped or something and we went into some parallel universe. It feels very odd. And in fact, things have become so odd that we've just gotten used to it. It's the new normal. A few days ago watching that presidential debate. How many of you got to watch the debate? I don't, I don't talk about politics very much and the truth is I, I'm an idiot so I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but you know, watching that debate, I had this feeling, if I can just be honest, can I just share with you from my heart the feeling that I have? I know some people were mocking some people were angry. Some people took advantage of that situation to make different points politically. I wasn't laughing about it because to me, there's nothing funny about what's happening right now. We are we're in a strange moment in the history of our world, in the history of our nation. And all I could think watching, I, uh, to be honest with you, I couldn't make it through that debate. It was just too cringy. I, I just didn't have the stomach for it. But one of the things I was thinking as I watched is it just kept coming to me over and over again is something is not right. This is, there, there's something going on here behind the scenes. I'm sure all of you or many of you understand. It's not something I can articulate. I'm not going to tell you that I'm a prophet with some word and I know what's going to happen, but I'm, I'm telling you what I sense in my spirit. Something is not right. And there are things going on behind the scenes that are not as they seem from the outside. And what I kept, fe uh, kept feeling in my heart is that there is a plot twist coming. This is not just gonna play out the way that a normal election cy cycle in the old days used to. Some of you, if you younger ones, you might not even remember what that was like. But now, Things are very different and I, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm telling you, there's a plot twist coming. There are people behind the scenes making deals and playing chess, and strategizing and coming up with ideas. We on the outside only see one layer of it and there are multiple layers to this thing. On the one hand, there is the, the narrative that the media wants you to hear and that the you know, the, the average ordinary person is supposed to believe. Then above that, there's another layer, which is the people behind the scenes in closed doors, behind closed doors making plans. And then above that, there's another layer, which is the spiritual world. And this is not like some hocus pocus, spooky, weird Christian stuff. This is Christianity 101. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen to that language. I mean, it's very vivid. The rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. That is the reality that the world that we live in above street level where we can see there are principalities, there are powers, there are spiritual battles that are going on that often we know nothing about. And they are influencing our world and we are in the middle of that. We feel it sometimes, we sense it even if we don't see it with our eyes. But I have good news for you that above that, there is another layer which is God seated upon his throne. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. He will set his king upon his holy hill of Zion. My friend, listen, our God is not with his back up against the wall. He's not shaking in his boots and wondering what to do next. He has a plan, and the good news is that we are a part of that plan. 
We are his people, we are his church. And so we don't just sit back and wait for it all to unfold. We are involved, we are engaged. Of course, we do the things we can do in the natural. We vote, we make our voices known, we speak out, but also we pray because we believe that prayer can change things, amen? amen. I'll tell you something else. I was just, I, I was just sitting there thinking this morning and I, I don't mean that, I don't wanna make this sound alarmist, but I, I feel like it needs to be said. I don't know how much longer this is gonna be like this. I don't know, I, I, I don't know what comes next. I can tell you something that, you know, when you talk about a plot twist, we almost had a plot twist yesterday. We were within like two inches of a 9-11 level significant event in our lifetime that would have changed history. World War I was started with an assassination. World War II came out of the mistakes made in World War I. Millions of people died as a result of that. You know, history can shift in these infl inflection points that we hardly notice them. And we, we go to bed one night, we wake up the next day and the world is totally different. We've seen it happen not too long ago. And I don't care which side of the political aisle you're on, I don't even care. But I will tell you this, I believe that the hand of God is on our nation. Because who knows what we could have woken up to this morning. I thank God. May it sober us and remind us that we, more than ever before, we need to pray. We need to seek the face of God. We need to humble ourselves. This is not a time to, to start condemning and fighting with one another. This is not a time to start becoming partisan. This is a time for us as the people of God to recognize that our first loyalty is not to Republicans or to Democrats or even to America. It is to the kingdom of God. We are brothers and sisters first. The kingdom of God is where our allegiance stands. We pledge our allegiance to the Lamb. Can you say amen? And we're gonna pray about that this morning. But while we're on the subject of prayer, I want us to be praying about something else as well because you know, you've seen these videos and these, and these uh, incredible sites from the, from the platforms and this very nicely curated video, it's wonderful, but I want you to understand what it takes to make these things happen. It's a little bit premature, but they went ahead and put those pictures up in the screen. This is our team that is out on the field right now. They have been driving those trucks for weeks to Congo, which is where our next big push is. We've got six different crusades that are about to take place in Congo. I leave in just a few days for this. And it's very, very difficult to get to. And we just got a letter from, uh, a message from our crusade director who's talking to Winifred Ventland, who is the guy that is the director of this team that's driving these trucks. Because you know, the reason that, we, that there's trucks, just so you understand, we are completely self-contained. We bring everything in, we take everything out, we bring in the lights, the generators, the speakers, the sound, everything it goes in with us and comes out with us. So much so that I remember in one city we were in a Muslim area and the, the, the governor, a Muslim governor wanted to shut us down. And our crusade was happening up on the, the hill. And so the governor directed the, the, the government, the, the power company to shut the power off to the whole city, thinking that it was gonna turn our lights off, not realizing we generate our own power. So he shut all the lights off in the city except for ours, and everybody came. <laughs> but to get that equipment in, you have to understand that these guys, they spend weeks, months, sometimes months at a time on the road traveling to these different places. They, they don't sleep in hotels, they sleep on the top of their trucks. They don't eat at restaurants, they eat bush meat. Whatever they can get their hands on. Some of those roads that they traverse are nothing but mud holes. They advance foot by foot, mile by mile with recovery winches and tow chains. Sometimes it could take a, several hours just to go one mile. When they find bridges that have been swept away by floods, they build new ones. They engineer and build new bridges. That's, that's what it takes to get to these crusade fields. When they're 
plagued with dirty fuel, they siphon it out of the tank and they filter it through their t-shirts and put it back into the tank and keep going. These are the heroes behind the scenes that make this thing work. They risk their lives. They live for months in discomfort so that people can hear the gospel. That's why when I mean it when I say my part is the easy part. I get up and I preach and it so, looks so lovely. My friend, to make that moment happen, many people, even thousands of people have worked and toiled to do it, but they need our prayers right now. Here is the letter that we got from our director. He said, I just got off the phone with Winnie, the leader of this team. They were about halfway through their journey to the first six crusade sites in the Congo. It's been the roughest drive they've had for a while. They're only able to advance a short distance at a time. They're having a very difficult situation, so we're gonna pray for them as well. We're gonna pray for our nation. We're gonna pray for our world. We're gonna pray for our team out on the field. What they're doing there will result in millions of people hearing the gospel. So we, it's time for us to pray, amen? So I'm gonna have uh, Scotty Cahill come and Brother Cohen come, and Scotty's gonna pray for um, America, and Brother Cohen's gonna pray for Africa. You guys were just there not too long ago organizing a crusade, so you've, you've got it fresh in your heart. So let's pray, can we stand? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that uh, your hand is still on this nation, and we see it, God. We see it clearly with what's happening right now in these circumstances. God, I pray we have the eyes to see, the ears to hear of what's truly going on right now. Not the fear, not, not the concern, God, but may we be a people of hope. God, people of righteousness. God, people that point people to you right now, God. And as people are searching right now and seeing what's going on, God, may we just step forward boldly, God, and uh, just speak your word, God, in a way. God, pray for the people that are in our government right now that are standing on behalf of the people in the church, God, that are going into harm's way. God, I pray that you would just have divine protection for them, for our peace, God, and encouragement, God, something that gives them an understanding of what their true role is, God. Just may they renew their efforts during this time, God. I pray us as a church, as a church, God, that we can intercede and continue to pray for these people, God, to highlight these people, God, that we can stand for, we can pray for, God, to understand, God, what your purposes are in the governmental realm, God. And we pray for this nation right now, God, a nation, God, that when all the world seemed to stop yesterday, God, and not sure what was gonna happen next, God, I pray that this nation will learn to turn its back, turn back to you, God, and to see what it means, a nation whose the Lord is their God right now, God. I, you've given us so many chances, God, and I just pray right now as a church, as a nation, God, that we're there. I pray for divine protection for President Trump and his family right now, God, for what they are going through. God, I pray that you have a, a spiritual protection, God, and just allow him to see you and see your hand in through all of this right now. So we pray this in your son's name. Amen. The Lord said to Joshua, everywhere your foot treads, I'm giving you the land. So Lord, we lift up the people in Congo right now that everywhere they put their foot, everywhere they tread, Lord, that you would give them the land, that you would give them the land. We rebuke the devil in Congo right now in Jesus' name. We pray that you would frustrate the plans of the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, begin to pray. Lift up your voice, pray, pray, pray. Lord, pour out your spirit upon the technical team, upon every driver, give them health, Give them strength. Give them divine wisdom in Jesus' name. We pray that you will level every road in Jesus' name. Lord, that you will level every road in Jesus' name. Lord, bring down every mountain in the name of Jesus. We rebuke the devil in Congo. We pray, Lord, that you will pour your spirit in Jesus' name. That you will pour out your wisdom in Jesus' name. Lord, that you will break every chain that is trying to hold them back in the name of Jesus. 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 Pour your spirit, God. Pour out your spirit, God. Save Congo in Jesus' name. Save the people of Congo in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray that you will break every plan the enemy has for the tech team. We pray for every vehicle to be driving good in Jesus' name. For every single electrical system on the truck to be working good in Jesus' name. For every body, every health, we rebuke every sickness in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Scotty. You can be seated. How many of you love the Word of God this morning? Yeah. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Galatians. We are.
picking back up here in chapter 5 where we left off last time. If you've been following along, we've been going chapter by chapter through the book of Galatians, sometimes interrupted when we have to go to the field or something, but we're making our way through it slowly but surely. So I want to just begin in verse 1, and I want to pick up and, and give us a little bit of runway so that when we get to the new text for today, there's a little bit of context. So once again, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. Remember, that was the name of my message last week, stay free. It is for freedom that you have been set free. Now walk in that freedom, walk in that liberty. Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Verse two, listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. Listen to this language. I say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. And then we come to the next part. This is the new part. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. What a mouthful. Every single word in that verse is intentional and loaded and important. We live by the Spirit. How many of you know the Spirit is the source of our life? In Him it says we live and move and have our being. And not only that, we live by the Spirit. By the Spirit, in other words, we're not just alive, we're not just you know, living beings, like animals, with lungs that absorb oxygen and hearts that pump blood. No, we are not just alive, we are truly living, because we live in the Spirit. And it says that we eagerly await. This is not just passive, apathetic complacency. There is an eager expectation in us, and yet we are waiting, the Scripture says. We're patient in our expectation, realizing that God is doing a continuous, ongoing work in us. How many of you know you're not finished yet? The work that God is doing in your life is ongoing. And what are we waiting for? It says that we're waiting for the righteousness that God has promised. It's a righteousness from God, and it's a righteousness that he has promised. Just like Abraham believed God when he promised that he would become the father of of many nations, even though he and his wife Sarah were too old to have children. And by believing that promise, the Bible says it was counted to him as righteousness. In that same way, we believe God that in the end, when we stand before his throne, we are going to be declared not guilty. We are going to be justified, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. And that faith that we have in that promise is count, counted to us as righteousness here and now. So not only will we be declared not guilty, but even in the moment we live as righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to become righteousness for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so, verse six, for when we place our faith in Christ, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. And I think that that, to me, is kind of the linchpin of this whole chapter. Paul says, what is important is this. Now, all of it's important, right? This is God-breathed. So if the author of the passage tells you this is what is important, you should underline that. And that's what Paul says. This is what is important, faith being expressed by love. In fact, that's the name of my message for today. It's faith by love. I would write it like this, faith by and then the multiplication sign, love. Faith by love. Faith working through love. And Paul says, this is what's important, so maybe we should take a little bit of time to understand it. It was also Paul that wrote the book of Ephesians, where he says in chapter two, verse eight, a very famous passage that every good Protestant evangelical should know by heart. Paul says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And of course, most of us stop there. We quit reading there, which has led a lot of 
Protestants to think that works are not important and that works don't matter. But you've got to keep reading. Actually, Paul is right in the middle of a thought with that sentence. You've got to read verses 8, 9, and 10 together to see the whole picture. Let's do it. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, you were not saved by good works, but you were saved for good works. Say amen. amen. Before you were saved, there was nothing good in you. There was nothing you had to contribute but now that you have been saved, there should be an overflow of the life of Christ working inside of you that abounds to good works. And if your life is not abounding to good works, maybe you should ask yourself if you really do have the new life inside of you, because that will be the natural outflow. And if you're concerned about that, if you say, well, Daniel, that just doesn't sound very Protestant. Even John Calvin, one of the reformers, one of those men that God used to bring about a restoration of the truth of salvation by grace through faith. Listen to what Calvin says. It is not our doctrine that the faith which justifies is alone. We maintain that it is invariably accompanied by good works. Only we contend that faith alone is sufficient for justification. Again, it's not that, faith, that, that works don't matter. As it pertains to salvation, works are meaningless. But once you are saved, good works should be the natural overflow of the Christian life. So when Paul talks about faith expressing itself through love, he is perfectly in line with the rest of scripture. He's in line with what Jesus teaches about this. He's in line with what James teaches about this. In fact, you know, in the book of James, I love the way that James talks about the relationship between faith and works because he makes it intensely practical. And sometimes that's what we need. Sometimes our spirituality is so lofty and high and ethereal that it doesn't affect things going on in the here and now. But a truly spiritual life, you know, there's that old saying, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. You ever heard that? That should never be the case. The more heavenly minded that you are, if it's true spirituality, the more earthly good you should become. And so let's just read the way that James talks about it. Just turn there with me very quickly to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter two, I'm just gonna read this, just verse by verse, is that okay? You guys don't mind me using so much scripture while preaching the word? James chapter two, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Now listen, he's not saying that works save you. He's saying that the kind of faith that does save you will be manifest in good works. Suppose you see a brother or sister that has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does it do? So you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone might argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. A little sarcasm coming here. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. They believe it more than you do. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. So it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. And so, you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. One more example, verse 25. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them away safely by a different road. Just as the body is dead without the brain, or breath, sorry, just as the body is dead without breath. It's dead without the brain too, by the way. <laughs> so also faith is dead without good works. And so once again, just to make sure there's no confusion here, these good works 
are not the same as what the Judaizers were teaching, that you can earn righteousness with God by keeping the law. Instead, these good works that Paul is talking about and James is talking about and Jesus was talking about are the natural outgrowth of a life lived in the Spirit. And this is something that we'll talk about a lot more in the next message when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, which naturally comes out of a life lived in the Spirit. But, you know, this is a message that the Protestant evangelical American world desperately needs to hear because a lot of Christians in our circles have misunderstood the message of the gospel. They've heard, you're saved by grace through faith, it's not of your works. So then they say, well, works don't matter. It's just about what I believe. As long as I subscribe to the right list of doctrinal statements, then I'm okay. But that's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that without him, you can do nothing. But with God, all things are possible. Those two things go together, hand in hand. And so I just wanna say this to you. If you are born again, the idea that you're just sitting back in your hammock, kind of sipping your lemonade, you can't do anything, so you're just letting God do what he does, and you're just gonna skate into heaven by the skin of your teeth, that is not biblical. No, no, my friend, listen. You can live a disciplined life. I hear Christians saying all the time, I can't do it, but he can. No, no, if, you, if he's inside of you, that means you can do it. You can do what he asks you to do. You can obey him, you can serve him. Yes, you can resist temptation. Yes, you can avoid sin. Yes, you can love your neighbor. Yes, you can forgive someone that has wronged you, you can. Yes, you can live free of addictions and compulsions. You can be generous. You can be prosperous. You can be joyful. You can be peaceful. You don't have to live under that bondage anymore. No, you don't need to be depressed. No, you, 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 you don't need to be afraid. No, you don't need to gossip and slander with your mouth. No, you don't need to be lazy and undisciplined. No, you don't need to be rude and nasty to people. No, you don't need to fall into temptation. Yes, you can get out of bed in the morning and pray. You can. Yes, you can read your Bible and study it and memorize it and live in it. Yes, you can resist that pornography on your computer. Yes, you can stop doom scrolling on Instagram and TikTok. Yes, you can put down the video game controller. Yes, you can share the gospel boldly. Yes, you can lead people to Jesus. You can and you must because Christ lives in you. That's the gospel. For the Christian, it's not I can't do it, it's I can do it because. Christ lives in me. Verse seven, Paul says to them, you were running the race so well, who has held you back from following the truth? And I like the way that the NIV translates it better. It's a, it's a closer translation to the original. In the NIV it says, you were running a good race who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth. Imagine you're running and someone steps right in front of you and cuts in on you and they trip you up and they break your stride and it slows you down. That's the image that Paul is using. And if you're not a runner, maybe you can relate more to what happens in traffic here in Orlando. For those of you that are watching this online, you have to realize in Orlando we get like, what is it, like 70 million tourists a year, which means that at any given time, the majority of the people are all from somewhere else. And, and you guys know what it's like, they'll just cut in on you and you have to slam on your brakes and it makes your heart rate go up and then you say all kinds of godly things. <laughs> this is the picture that Paul is giving. Someone's cut in on you, they've made you slam on the brake, they slowed you down, they've tripped you up. You were running so well, he says. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one that called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. And of course, we, we get most of our bread nowadays at the grocery store, so we're kind of disconnected with the power of the metaphor of yeast. But you know, yeast is a single-celled fungus. It's a fermenting agent. It's what causes your bread to rise and to taste nice. Have you ever eaten unleavened bread? That's well, disgusting. Nobody likes unleavened bread. 
The leaven is, it's a, it's a fungus that it, it, it begins to cultivate in the dough and, and it spreads. It starts out very small and then before you know it, it's, it's gone through all of the dough. And, and, and one of the things you can do, and they used to do back then, is they would keep a little piece of the dough from a previous batch. When they made a new batch, they'd put that that piece of the old into the new and it would permeate through the new lump of dough. And this is a a picture in the scriptures that's used for uh, a metaphor of the way that corruption spreads. It's used as a metaphor by Jesus with the Pharisees talking about the way that hypocrisy works. And here Paul is using leaven as a metaphor for false doctrine. And what he's saying here is that this leaven that has come into this church is not going to remain isolated here. It's gonna spread. And it's going to go to the next church and the next church. Before you know it, the entire body of Christ around the entire world is going to be filled with this false doctrine. we got to get it out. And this also was, was something that, that especially the Jews would have understood very well because at Passover every year there was a ceremony where they would go through the house with brooms and, and even with feathers and they would collect every crumb, anything that had leaven in it. And they would ceremonially take it outside and burn it and get rid of it and then declare that the house was clean. And Paul is saying the the house of God needs to be rid of this false doctrine before it gets infected. This is serious. Verse 10, I'm trusting the Lord to keep you from believing false doctrines. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. Can I tell you something? This is why the scripture says that those who teach are going to be held to a stricter judgment. And nowadays, uh, this just needs to be said, it's going out over social media and everything. People are very quick now, they've, they've got their Facebook or their Instagram, and they're just quick to teach. Anybody can have a platform now. Isn't it amazing how some of, the, some of the people that are the most listened to are not people that have studied the scriptures for years. When I was a kid, you know, it's like you listened to the guy with gray hair that's read the Bible through 500 times and has memorized entire books and you know he's read 12 commentaries on what he's teaching to you and he's invested the time before God in prayer. Now it's just some social media influencer, some 16 year old with a cool hairdo telling you the way that things are and and all these people are accepting it as though it's revelation. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you are influenced by. And those of you that seek to be teachers, remember you will be judged for what you say, for what you teach, for how you influence. You will give an account of that before God. If you're going on social media teaching without fear in your heart, you better stop. Dear brothers and sisters, he says, verse 11, if I am preaching that you must be circumcised as some say I do, then why am I still being persecuted? If I were no longer preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, then no one would be offended. One of the rumors that was apparently going around was that the Judaizers were saying, look, Paul is telling you that you have to be circumcised, but then when he goes to the Jews, he, he acknowledges the value of circumcision and even tells people to be circumcised. He's a hypocrite and he's lying to you. For example, when he took Timothy in his mission to the Jews, Timothy had to be circumcised. But it wasn't because Timothy needed circumcision to earn his salvation. It's because that Paul wanted to become all things to all people so that he might win some. He wanted to be able to remove the stumbling blocks that there were for these Jews receiving the gospel. That's why Timothy was circumcised. And yet, his opponents, his accusers, were trying to use this against him. Can I tell you something? This is how the devil works. The devil's lies and his slanders are not made out of whole cloth. They are very often a truth that has been perverted and distorted. The most damnable lies are the ones born in truth, conceived in truth, but they're twisted truths. Every cult has a core kernel of truth at the bottom of it, but it's twisted and it's used in a different way and a twisted truth is not truth at all. And he says, the very fact that they keep harassing me is proof that I'm not teaching circumcision. Because if I was, I'd be on their team and they'd leave me alone. The very fact they keep attacking me tells you that I'm not teaching what they teach. Verse 12, I wish that those troublemakers who want to mutilate you by circumcision would go on to mutilate themselves. 
And uh, this is a, an interesting passage. It's written very nicely in the NLT that we're reading here. But it's actually quite a vivid, graphic euphemism. He's saying, these Judaizers that keep teaching you circumcision, I wish they would just slip and cut the whole business off. I wish they would castrate themselves. That's literally what it means. Now, some people just think that Paul was being a little bit crass and using very vivid language because he was angry or something. But actually, there's more here than meets the eye because there was a cult, a a pagan cult, that was very popular at that time. It was the cult of Sybil, the great mother. And one of the things that would happen in this cult is that the, the priests they would work themselves up into a frenzy in their worship of this false god, and then the priests would castrate themselves to show their devotion to this false god. And and Paul draws a distinction between the worship of the pagans, the way that they offer their bodies to their gods, and the way that Christians are to live. For Christians, the body is sacred. God became a man and was incarnated into a human body. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit in Paul's teachings. He brings dignity to the human body. And it's possible that Paul is actually alluding to that pagan practice, and he's trying to make this contrast. Religion wants you to do something terrible to yourself, mutilate yourself in order to prove your devotion to God. But faith, expressed through love, is more concerned with doing something for others. Faith, expressed through love, is outward focused instead of inward focused. Faith, expressed through love, is upward looking to the cross instead of downward looking at yourself. Verse 13, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Where does Paul get this love theology? He gets it from Jesus. Remember, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And they were trying to trick him. They were trying to paint him into a corner. And what does Jesus say? The whole law and the prophets can be summed up with these two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You do those two things, you will naturally fulfill the requirements of the law. This is where Paul gets this idea from. When we see what Jesus did for us, that should create such a love in our hearts that now we want to do the same for others. Which by the way is a much more beneficial expression of faith than self-mutilation, which helps nobody. Isn't it interesting how most religious works are concerned with rituals and rites that don't help anybody. They might make the person performing the ritual feel better about themselves, but they don't help anyone. They don't feed the poor. They don't clothe the naked. They don't help a lost and dying world. They just make religious proselytes feel better about themselves. Verse 15, but if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. You know, one of the manifestations of this religious spirit, you know a religious spirit has infiltrated a community when you see people devouring one another, fighting, bitterness, backbiting. A religious spirit causes that. And and Paul interjects that here in the midst of this whole thing about law, grace, circumcision, all this stuff. And you might say, why, what is the relevance here? Remember Sesame Street? Which of these things is not like the others? Which of these things doesn't belong? Remember that? Sometimes when you're reading along and suddenly you see a verse interjected, it's like, oh, that doesn't seem to go there. Pay attention to those interruptions because very often there's gold hidden there. Beware, he says, in the middle of this conversation, of destroying one another if you're biting and devouring one another. Let me, let me tell you why this happens in religious context. It's because as we've been reading, what religion does is it makes you self-focused, inward focused, navel gazing. I'm looking at me. I'm trying to make sure that I've done the right things to me to make myself acceptable to God. And so that focus on self 
will ultimately end up making you feel good about yourself, proud of yourself, happy with your performance. And then when you become happy with yourself and proud of yourself, then you start looking down at other people. For those that are not as good as you, you look down at them and you criticize. For those that are better than you, you become jealous. Either way, you attack those around you. Faith working by love is the opposite. It's focused not on me and what I've done. It's not looking down. It's looking up at Christ and what he's done. And when I see his goodness, when I see his mercy, when I see his grace, I'm filled with the revelation of God's goodness and now I want to be good to those around me. It's not about looking at me anymore. Now it's about looking at him and loving the people that he loves. This is something the church has got to learn. This is an era, I don't know, again, I don't know if it's exacerbated by social media and the fact that everybody has a platform now, but it just seems like there's so much devouring of one another. There's so much fighting. In fact, there's entire platforms on social media that are optimized to keep us arguing and fighting and attacking one another, devouring one another. We need to learn to lift up our eyes. This is not the spirit of the Lord. Remember when, when James and John suggested calling fire down from heaven on Samaria because they didn't treat them well. Jesus rebuked them and he said, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's not me. We need to learn to distinguish between what is the spirit of Christ and what is the spirit of religion, the spirit of Christ and the spirit of the world, the spirit of Christ and the spirit of infighting and dissension and devouring and biting one another. May we become a people who are enthralled with the grace of God. We turn back to the cross and to faith expressing itself in love. Can we stand together?